Hello, my name is Michael Fail. I am the painter of the painting behind me. I wanted to do a little explanation of the painting and talk to people about the super radical experiences that I witnessed in my time that were the impetus to painting this painting, as well as other not so super radical happenings, but things that influenced me in my past to um, to uh, uh, be guided to different locations, um, as well as uh, to leaping off of a two-story roof, uh, which mangled myself at one time. And, and so, uh, without further ado, let me go ahead and start. Um, uh, March... Um, Actually, uh, uh, in September, uh, pardon, November 20th of 2007, I was sitting in my living room with my girlfriend, and a, I was painting a painting of the uh, happy, sad um, faces that are associated with uh, theatrical performances, the happy, sad, uh, jester faces. Um, and I was sitting in my living room, my girlfriend was in the kitchen at the time, and all of a sudden an orb moved across the living room uh, at a very slow pace, and then it paused in front of me. It was about, it was about a foot off the ground, and it was about six, seven feet from me, and it moved across the living room, and it paused for a second, and then it moved through the wall. And 20 minutes later, we got a phone call from her dad saying that her grandfather had just passed away. And the depiction of, of that orb is, is, is right up here. This is about life size. <laughs> to call it life size is interesting, but th that's about the size that it was, about a, a basketball-sized orb. And it had this infinity belt kind of running through it. And it was very three-dimensional and iridescent, transparent, translucent. And, and it shook me from the inside out. It made, it challenged my notions of what was possible in this reality. And so I went ahead and I depicted that because it appeared to be something very spiritual to me. Now, I didn't initially make the association between her grandfather dying and the orb, but she saw uh, the orb also and we discussed that at the time, so this helped me uh, with my notions of whether or not I was just seeing something out of my out of my mind's eye. Now, the 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 space it was in the evening. The sun was down. All the blinds were down. There was no direct light, uh, so it wasn't a refraction off of my retina or an after image. Uh, it wasn't a flashlight coming through the living room. Um, I wondered at the time whether or not something like radio waves could cause this uh, phenomena to occur in a specific locale, but there was no justification rationally that I could come up with that, that justified this, this orb. And um, so that, that was the first event that happened to me. Um, later on, uh, March 8th, of 2010, um, I was hearing for for a couple of months footsteps on the on the rooftop of my building. The rooftop is flat on my building, and um, uh, and and I kept just hearing these ticks and clicks, and then footsteps, and then what it sounded like laughter coming from up above me. Uh, the laughter could have been from outside, but nevertheless, this, this notion that someone was on my roof, I kept going outside and looking up to see if anyone was up there, but nobody was up there. 
and it was kind of driving me crazy actually and so I I had developed this this ceremony had come together after a lot of um, thinking about geometric patternings about pyramids and macabre uh, how pentagrams if you uh, see them in three dimensions can rotate into uh, hexagrams how two pyramids like a top spinning um, put on a mirror would look like an hourglass and kind of this hyperbola this cross-sectioning of an hourglass and seeing the pyramids uh, or these almost pyramidical shapes uh, of an hourglass how they could as you move closer to the center of the hourglass they would touch points like a pyramid touching the top of another pyramid and falling through it and I had drawn this 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 kind of nice size pentagram on a piece of paper and I had it on the ground and I had this snake in a bottle that was from China wrapped around bamboo it was a dead snake in a bottle and I had it uh, in my freezer and an old friend who had given it to me who had visited China said that this is Chinese truth serum so on this quest to find truth of what this was um, I went ahead and I glugged down a few gulps of this very harsh tasting um, drink uh, I wasn't on any other drugs I wasn't on any hallucinogens at the time <laughs> Uh, not to say I don't have a history of, of drug use, I do. Um, but nevertheless, uh, th there was also a death of a family friend that occurred two days before. Um, I had left the girlfriend that I had uh, a, a couple years earlier, the same one that I mentioned that saw the orb with me. And I was, I was depressed and lingering on her. And... Um, what ended up happening was I took this large fluorescent light bulb uh, about four feet long that I had next to this pentagram and I glugged this down and thinking of these geometric patterns I thrust the light bulb onto the pentagram and from the white dust inside of the light bulb appeared this ghostly head this started mumbling to me. That's what I depict down here is this white ghostly head and it rose up to my side about waist high and it mumbled. It was talking to me in something foreign and it was incredibly scary. It led me down my hallway all of about maybe 15 feet and it indicated that I should go up to the roof through the um, through the duct that was at, at the hallway and the duct is a water cooler duct so it has a, a large cubish water cooler on the top of the roof um, so I went ahead and proceeded to, to grab this um, uh, bookshelf and maneuver it into the hallway and I undid all the bolts on it the ghost went away but it it, sh it shook me from the inside out because I had never seen anything so literal as this ghost so I took what it was importing into my mind very literally and I took a stick after I got the water cooler vent open and a wire fell out because it, it was a discontinued uh, water cooler it wasn't working anymore and I pushed the water cooler over the top and and it fell over on its side and it pulled me right up to the the edge of the roof uh, where I got out onto the roof and when I got out onto the roof I looked around for these footsteps and, and there was nothing but I I found that there there's a light outside of my condominium complex that goes this just that shines just above the top of of the the building meaning a little bit of the light shines onto the roof and it was out because it has a short in it 
And anyway, I'm there and I'm standing on the roof and I turn around and I see this, this ladder of clouds ascending seven, seven steps to this star with this other bouncing star underneath it. And, and I was just awed by this cloud because it looked so much like a ladder. And so this was really, this was really playing this role in my mind about what to do. And, and then all of a sudden this light turned on on the roof and the little spouts that come out of a roof for, that kind of air out the ventilation or the plumbing in a house, they were all lined up right in front of me, just like a runway, just like a runway. And there was a house with a little pyramid on it that was right beneath the clouds. And this, to me, indicated that I needed to run and jump and grab this, this cloud. And, and climb to the stars, the star up here that the, that the ladder was leading to, in my mind, it immediately indicated uh, children that I had lost via abortion with my first love. It also represented my first love. I, I had this huge drive, this huge impulse, and maybe this snake drink was hallucinogenic. You can speculate on that all you would like. Um, listening to my story, but nonetheless, I, I depict myself down here at the bottom of, of, of getting, like I'm this little shadow man, and my heart is a fire. It's just, it just starts burning with this sensation that I need to run and leap, but I don't run and leap because only an insane person would run and leap and jump off of their roof. And so I pause at the edge of the opening back to the water cooler and I descend back into my condo. The act of descending into this little hole had me feeling like I was, like I was a rabbit. And so I depict a rabbit here because rabbit uh, symbolism started to play this huge role in me at the time. Besides that, there were a lot of uh, internet interactions where the certain people would dress up as rabbits or their names indicated rabbits. So there was this rabbit symbolism that was ricocheting around in my head. Anyway, I felt like a rabbit, like I was, had become this rabbit descending into its hole. And I look down and I see a feather on the ground, probably from one of my coat jackets, my winter coat jackets. And all of a sudden I had this notion, this Egyptian notion, that I needed to weigh my soul against the weight of a feather. In other words, that I should have jumped at that ladder. So immediately I go back to the roof, but this time, this time I don't use the bookshelf because I don't have the wire to pull me up. Instead I drag the bookshelf outside to, to an area where I can ascend the bookshelf and get onto the roof. And I fall into water, and I'm 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 deathly cold and frozen. But I don't mind. None of none of these things matter. Even though it was March, it was late at night. It was probably about 2 a.m. And the cloud had gone. The whole sky was just blank. I mean, this was all in a matter of less than 10 minutes of getting that bookshelf out and reascending to the roof. That the cloud had simply disappeared. There wasn't a cloud in the sky, and yet I knew something was wrong. I knew I needed to weigh my soul against the weight of a feather. So I found a star that was lowest on the horizon, and I focused my energy, and that star started to represent the girlfriend who I saw the orb with, whom I loved very much. And I just put all of my thoughts about all the people that I loved and her into that star. And I decided to just run and leap towards that star. So I ended up leaping off the roof, crashing to the ground, breaking both my feet and my spine, and ending up in a nursing home for five and a half months and under rehabilitation for roughly a year. 
So that whole story makes me feel <laughs> rather insane telling it. Um, but a year later, uh, a year later uh, goes by, and I'm back on my feet to some extent after after multiple surgeries and, and living in the nursing home and watching watching people die and having this huge empathetic response to these older people dying. Um, uh, September 24th of 2011, I'm listening to the internet again. I'm back at my place. I'm listening to the internet again. And all of a sudden, these symbols started coming together as if the internet was speaking to me directly as a, you know, opposed to speaking about regular rational things in, in the manner of its own discourse, the, the conversation on the internet started to speak directly to me, metaphoristically, like, like words taking on a multiplicity of meaning, and I was able to select these subtexts, this metaphoric meaning, and put it together in my mind. And then different artifacts, different signs and symbols and labels started to play a role in my psychology as to actually lead me out of my condominium complex and, and to get into my car. At this point, uh, a friend of mine had drawn a pentagram with each point representing a different organ in the body as well as a different color and some arrows that traverse the direction in which you were supposed to follow this pentagram you know, from point to point as well as around the pentagram, a circle around the pentagram. And I grabbed that as well as all of these other colored items. I grabbed items that represented each of these five colors and I threw them all in my car just very quickly. And this symbolism and this kind of psychosis, this, this weird notion that I was being guided was completely completely enveloped my mind and my being. And, and a, a cat had crossed my path when I was loading the car, which took on that, that, you know, the notion of never let a black cat, and it was a black cat, cross your path. It was as if it was a starting gauge for me to go. And I went back up in the condo to grab a few more of these just seemingly odd items that had nothing particular to do uh, with anything other than that they represented the color or that I was being told via, via other symbols in my household to grab. So I took them and I stuffed them in a duffel bag and I went out again and I got in my car and the cat crossed my path again in exactly the same direction as it had before on the same line and I knew that this was like in the matrix a weird glitch in reality it was absolutely a, a weird thing but it meant to me I needed to go I needed to travel and continue following the signs so I turned on the radio and I listened to the subtext of songs guiding me and I watched as the side of big rigs passed me by and the different words that they had on them, and the words, the letters that were on license plates. And I let everything feed my consciousness as if there was really agency in the universe that was outside of me. And it felt like that. It felt like there was an agent that had control entirely of all of the items that I could possibly see. And so I followed this from Salt Lake City all the way up to Montana. And for example, I was listening to Johnny Cash's I Walk the Line. And something that I brought into the car was yellow. And there was a yellow line on the left-hand side of the road. And so, and something else indicated that I should not break the law, do not break the law, probably from another song. So I put the cruise control at 65 and 75 miles an hour, depending on where it was, you know, what the mileage was per hour allowed. And I stayed in the left-hand lane, 
and I drove all the way up to Montana. And on the way, I saw this whole flock of beautiful little butterflies flying around me. And it was very, it was very, um, how to put it, like it, it was a lovely, ingratiating, soulful experience. I was at awe by these butterflies. And occasionally a fly, a fly would land in my grill. I would see it land in the grill of the car. And I would pull over the car immediately and I, I would open the hood and I would try to save the butterfly, these dying butterflies that landed on the front of my, my car. Now, I'm just telling you all of these things that were going on in my mind to give you guys a backstory, a little bit of presence about the painting. Anyway, um, I found a little cardboard box underneath the driver's seat and I placed each dying butterfly in there with this sensation like I could heal them or I could make them better or, you know, that I was repenting of their death, which was not, you know, I was it, it, having the family friend die uh, a, a year earlier was still playing on me because he was a close, a close family friend. And just this idea of death that I saw in the nursing home and this empathy that I had developed was like over exaggerated to the point where I was caring for the butterflies. You know, I'm I'm vegetarian now, but I had wafted in and out of vegetarianism, but that's a that's another story. Anyway, on my way up to Canada, I was I was driven to go up to Canada to meet a woman. That was in my mind also. And so I had stopped to buy these two coconut rings that I found at a gas station when I was filling up my tank. And keep in mind, the whole time I'm in this mode, it was like uh, pulling your reality inside out, like the inside out of a sock. And I kind of depict this end of a sock here being pulled inside out like a universe, like the universe is being pulled inside out, and what's being shot out is love, this love here. And anyway, the the day had turned into night, and it was late at night, probably close to 3 a.m., but I could not stop driving. As a matter of fact, I faded a couple of times, and I ran into these cement barriers on the side of the road, scratching the car, uh, re-alerting me that I must stay awake, I must follow all of these symbols that are going on, even though I was, I was so tired as to fall asleep at the wheel. And so, you know, I just, I, I bought coffee, but I didn't pull over anyway. I'm driving alone late at night, pitch black road in Montana through these mountainous areas. And all of a sudden, off in the distance, coming closer to me as I'm driving closer to it, is this huge, red, electronic-looking, jellyfish-like star that was probably 15 to maybe 25 feet long, hovering probably 14, 15 feet off at the top of the highway, just hovering in the air, just hovering there. It was as abnormal super radical, not explainable, empirical, as empirical as my hand, as, as real to me as any other object, yet it was something that I had never heard of, I'd never seen, I've never seen an explanation for it. Um, there were no other lights around. All I know is here is this magnificent star in the sky, this red star, and it felt to me as if that was the point of me being called up there. The kind of like in Close Encounters of the Third Kind, he couldn't figure out what the symbolism was, but he was being drawn and being drawn to that mountainous area. In my case, I was being drawn, and here was the star, and I'm cruising towards it, but it was so red, and the symbol of redness to me whether or not, even though it was on my, my legend, my, my, my five-star legend, the color red was there, it haunted me as if it was, it was deathly like hell. It haunted me deeply. And the notion, something on the radio mentioned a cat, 
and all of a sudden, curiosity killed the cat came to my mind. And I got so afraid of it while I was cruising close to it that I just pushed down the accelerator even more and I drove right underneath it. And I looked in my rear view mirror and I saw it in my rear view mirror. And I remember thinking while I was looking in the rear view mirror, this thing is real. It's reflecting in my rear view mirror, you know. So anyway, I drove away from it fearfully, but I was still in a psychotic state for at least another three days. And up in Montana, I had, I was guided, it felt like, by stars and by the radio, by other symbolism, by the legend, by all the things I put in the car, by my memories. Everything was coming together, and I went to a swamp, and I realized I was being told by the songs on the radio I needed to get out on my broken feet, bare feet, and walk through all of this chopped down wheat in this wheat field to the edge of this swamp. And so I went to the edge of this swamp, which was probably a good hundred feet wide, and I couldn't tell you how long it was, late at night, with all of these stars. And there was a sensation that each star has agency and is speaking to me. And it was felt as if I needed to speak back to them. And so I started a dialogue with the stars, singing to them. And yet I knew I had to swim because there was these spotlights moving from tractors that work late at night in Montana, chopping down these weeds or this wheat. And they were moving around in the, in behind on the other side of the swamp. So I got in the swamp and I swam out into the swamp and there was this branch that looked as if it was moving in the water like a snake and all of a sudden this this idea I had taken dead snake I had drank in the dead snake snake uh, the notion of Jim Morrison's song ride the snake came to mind and I so I ended up putting in this painting a snake figure with a little man riding the snake the little man riding the snake is riding over the top of a pyramid, over the top of hierarchies, over the top of everything that you could imagine, all of your spiritual and to, all of your spiritual inside to be in in its most in its greatest idealism, moving to a singular point, kind of like the singular point that I ran to when I leaped off the roof. And and so I came across and thinking it was a snake, I arose and I kissed its tip, and then I realized it was a branch and not a snake at all. Nevertheless, I came out of the swamp, I came back, and so that was the, the third super radical thing that I saw was that star. On that adventure, before I ended up being caught by police uh, next to the side of a railroad track, I climbed into railroad cars because because this is a day later and I had got to the Canadian border and I think that they saw that I was a little out of whack. So they turned me back and they said I wasn't allowed in the country, but I was bound and determined to get across the border. So I kept on with this this notion that I needed to hop a train, so I hopped a train. Because the woman I was attempting to go see, her sister had worked on a train, and the notion of trains came to mind, and there were trains there. And as the trains moved south, I imagined there being a burning inferno in all the train cars that were moving south. And when you died, if you were bad and your soul was moving south or downward, as if the legend on a map went from north, south, east, and west, it also meant upward and downward. And so any train that was going south meant down, meant hellish. Any train that was going northward meant you were on the right track. I was following the right path. And so I ended up jumping trains and, and hopping out of them because I had more notions that I would be caught in a in a a yard where they dumped the coal into the trains because they were coal trains 
and that no one would see me and they would just dump coals upon me. Anyway, out of fear I got out, staring on the side of a train, imagining the kind of a hermeneutic, what could these birds and these animals that were surrounding me be meaning to me, be talking to me. I felt very Native American. I felt as if I was bonding with animalia gods. I was bonding with directionality. And, and all of this was playing this role on my psyche. And anyway, I was institutionalized for a couple of days before family members came to get me. And at this time, uh, this was before the last uh, election, but Mitt Romney and Barack Obama were already kind of in the airwaves talking to one another. And politically speaking, it was as if my thoughts were affecting politics or politics were affecting my thoughts. And so anyway, this is my history of psychosis, the history of harming myself, but it's based on seeing these things and falling out of order. Now, um, the painting, I, I had fallen into a, a great depression since this happened, but when I broke my feet, I show my feet down here as skeletal feet. And I show a pentagram with a flame coming out of it as indicating this is beneath us. This, is, this, this idea is harbored. And I have my, like, if my children weren't aborted, I have one in vitro or in utero here on this side with this, my ex-girlfriend pregnant here. And I realized she could also be my future girlfriend and wife. So I considered that as I was painting it. But I painted my son here, whether future or past son, I painted him here thinking that the sins of the father translate into the son. So if I did have a child having to explain to the child a psychotic melt and the breaking of my feet, they would have something akin to that. So I painted my son as a skeleton also. And I'm pulling my heart out of my chest and I'm hanging it down in front of the star and the starlight or the yeah the starlight is essentially shooting at this huge ace of diamonds at this red diamond kind of like a ruby but I call it a diamond a red diamond and it's shooting its its light towards towards my future wife towards this bouquet I put a bouquet of yellow roses around her, partially because my grandfather is really partial to yellow roses, or he was before he passed. And she was originally nude, but what ended up happening is, as I was painting this painting, when I got to the end, I had, and this was just in December 15th of 2013, I had painted down below a lot of flames. I painted a lot of flames all over the base and around the painting as if the painting itself was burning. But I woke up to this notion that my soul was destined to burn, that I am going to hell, that whoever I am and whoever I become is hellbound, and that I was judged in that particular fashion. So immediately I erased out, I, I painted over all the flames into different colors and I wrote a tone across this ace of diamonds and I was trying to get through this redemptive process and I was thinking about weaving. I originally had this this nude Lady Liberty who represented the girlfriend I saw the orb with over here. How she's bound to me to my most angelic self. And so I have her here, but I have this future wife who was nude, but there was this, this indiscretion, kind of this indecency that came to mind at the same time that I needed to cover up all of my indecencies. So I immediately painted clothes on my Lady Liberty and I painted clothes on her, but I left a few of the strands of her sweater undone. 
as if she was able to unweave her sweater as a metaphor for being able to unweave the history of my life that I was seeing in this burning fashion as such a negative, a negative element of self. And so I have her unweaved here. Now, I had mentioned that I had fallen into a depressive state, and somewhere back when I, this took me uh, two and a half months to paint. Um, and so I started, I think, in early October, um, before I finished it, of last year. And somewhere in October, I went out to eat with my family, and this waitress showed up and just leaned over my family members and asked my name and shook my hand. And it awakened me to wanting to be a better man, just like in the movie As Good As It Gets. She, in an instant, became this angelic figure that just made me want to change my life. And so I show her kind of ghostly as this apparition that had this effect, kind of coming out of one of the roses to pull me up to liberty. Now I painted my ex-girlfriend as liberty because I miss her so much but she's granting me the liberty to carry on and find a new relationship. So I painted her there. My higher self, the angelic self, I have two tattoos on my body that are on my shoulder blades, and they're my parents' signatures. And to me, they represent where angel wings would be attached. So anytime I'm feeling very enlightened, very spiritually heightened, I think about being an archangel. So my higher self is coming down to kill my lower self. I represent my lower self as a clown. I've painted a lot of clowns in my time. And, and I've identified with a clown in a lot of respects. And yet that is my lower self. And I painted on top of an American flag. So he's killing the clown through the American flag because I had developed such a kind of a following of Alex Jones and this negativity of politics that comes to weigh upon us so often. And, and so I, I had developed this desperation. There was a desperation in me to correct the politics, to do something, anything I could, to rally support against the policies of our government. And so I, this was representing this lower, angry, clownish state, not knowing what to do about it. I am a clown. And, and the death of the clown, that the higher me, the greatest angelic me, is able to, to put death to the clown. And so the Archangel Michael goes into hell to fight Satan. So in a way, this was the clown's space. This was the clown's palace with these ionic columns and a Corinthian column. And when the angel descended, the columns broke. They broke apart. The building structure was breaking and fleeing apart. It's as if the foundation of the clown temple was being ruptured. But the clown drops a grenade, and it's like an art grenade that my, my life is about sending off art to the world and because that's what my life is dedicated to. And so in a way it's an explosion of art. This whole thing is supposed to just be a radical, symbolic explosion of art to the individual. Now, I, I paint uh, the death of the clown and because my girlfriend at the time associated the orb with her dying or her dead grandfather, like that was his spirit. I painted another orb over here floating in the sky. And then the death of the clown, his soul goes up and is caught by two angels. Well, I say these are representative of my parents. My parents catch my soul when I die. And so I put them there. So I'm an angel, they're angels. I put halos, even though I felt as if I was burning and going to hell, I put a halo above my head, but I put a little a little line down to the back of the head, indicating like it's like it's a, 
a childhood angel's costume. It's not a real halo. It's a costume that I put on. So in a way, I'm like lying to myself. I'm killing myself. I'm protecting my son from an explosion that I'm creating. So I protect him with a shield over here. But I'm hunting myself as a rabbit. I am a cat. And I'm hunting myself as a rabbit through time. Because because I'm trying to I'm trying to commit the rabbit test the 1950s rabbit test which is you take a woman's blood and you inject it in a rabbit and if the rabbit dies that means she's pregnant and so I show the cat chasing the rabbit in order to kill the rabbit but I have the snake here postured almost to attack the cat so it's like my most clownish state, the most base, reptilian, cold-blooded state that I've ever been in is to kill my most aggressive being which wants to fertilize and have children. It's all, it's all kind of, to me, it's all based on, on a, a moonscape late at night where these events seem to happen. So I put aspen trees up climbing that that the goal in my life is to climb a mountain, reach the pinnacle of everything that I can be and everything that I can become. And so I put a mountainscape on the top, even if the top is frigid and cold, even if it's got a face of terror, even a regression, it's to be climbed, that the whole thing is to be climbed. And so the ace is a shadow of self. This is a representation of myself broken and re-repaired and protective. This is a representation of self, the lower man, the higher man. And all of this, this, these echoes of meaning that came about to develop this painting all started when I started having these fissures in reality. And Thank God I was with my girlfriend at the time, and she saw the orb also. Otherwise, I would have been able to sum up that I was simply projecting these images in my mind, and not that they were actually happening. Because I'm a person that believes in UFOs and aliens, and I allow people to speak to me about their encounters with Bigfoot in a realistic sense, like I'm going to trust their word. I believe in magic and interdimensionality. I believe in all of these things because there was a rupture three times, four times, one that's not depicted here, that were so amazingly out of reality's ground that it pulled my reality out, inside out, and left me as this kind of broken psychologically broken, trying to self-rehabilitate, culturally rehabilitate, and get back to a rational setting, yet I still have to depict it. I still have to echo what's happened. So that's essentially the painting, the allegory of an archangel is to come down and, and, and perform all these stunts and echo and match with feminine aspects of being. That's the painting. Any comments that you guys might leave on the video would be more than welcome. Um, I'm more than happy to hear them from you. And um, I don't know. Let me let me know what you think of my story, my stories. And um, and thanks for listening. Uh, at some point, I'll put this on my website so prints will be available. Thank you so much for your time. Goodbye.